Okay. Now we're looking at uh, Old Testament texts that indicate the Messiah will suffer and be killed. And thus far we've looked at portions of Psalm 22, relevant verses from the third and fourth servant songs from Isaiah, and also Daniel chapter 9 verse 26. And then when we ended we were looking at Zechariah chapter 12 verses 10 to 14, focusing especially on chapter 12, verse 10, and you see how 12, 10 to 14 plays out. You remember we've got the, the back end of Zechariah 9 to 14, we've got 9 to 11, and then, and then 12 to 14, and then you have four messages in 12 to 14, and this is the second part of the first message is where we're looking. And uh, Zechariah 12, 10 to 14, it declares that at some unidentified future time, God will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication, meaning he will persuade or convict the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem so as to move them to express pity or remorse and to plead for divine mercy, which will occur in conjunction with their looking on God, on me, whom they have pierced. Now, I suggested to you that this is a reference to those Jews who came to the Christian faith in Jerusalem where the full faith began, the faith that included Jesus' resurrection and his ascension to heaven, as Peter explains in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 41. And Luke 24, 45 to 47, it says, Then he, Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And I think that's what's being talked about here in Zechariah. Now that Jewish nucleus that comes to the full Christian faith in Jerusalem, that Jewish nucleus of, of believers in Christ expanded within Judaism from Jerusalem, and that expanded nucleus then became the root of the universal church. You see, Gentile Christians were grafted into that Jewish root became part of Israel's history by faith, as Paul explains in Romans chapter 11, verses 17 to 24. Now, right when we ended last week, I pointed out that the specific families that are identified in this text as mourning, they represent the royal and the priestly lineages, the political and religious leadership of Israel that was responsible for the pierced one's death. And I suggested to you that this symbolizes the culpability of the redeemed in that death. And by that I mean that, see, we are saved despite having put Jesus on the cross by our sins. We are culpable in his death, and yet we're the beneficiaries of that death. Now, whatever the uncertainties and ambiguities of this text, it's clear from verse 10 that the one who pours out the spirit of grace and supplication is the Lord. The one who in verses 8 and 9 protects Jerusalem from the described assault in verses 1 to 9. Verse 10 specifies that it is he, the divine one who is pierced. Now some claim that this must be a metaphorical piercing because it's impossible literally to pierce God since he's not flesh and blood. But as Walter Kaiser points out, he says, but that's precisely the point. It is the Messiah's flesh that has been pierced. He who is one with God the Father in essence and being. Right? So that's what I'm saying, how these things look. Well, after the fact, you could see somebody saying, no, well, this must be a metaphorical piercing because God doesn't have flesh and blood. But after the Messiah and after his death and resurrection, as we then look back, it crystallizes. You see the meaning. So that's what I think is going on. Now, 
Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 is in fact cited in reference to Jesus in John chapter 19 verse 37. He says, beginning in verse 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he's telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. That's right out of Zechariah 12.10. So the spirit through John is affirming what I'm telling you, that this is indeed a reference to the Lord Jesus. Now in Zechariah 13.7, we have here the third message of the second oracle. We have the third message of the second oracle. It's this, uh, an abrupt poem. You see down here, 1379? It's this abrupt poem about the striking of the shepherd and the scattering of the sheep that we see in Zechariah 1379. And here in that text, there God, he wields the sword against his own shepherd. He wields the sword against his own shepherd, a man described as his associate or companion, one who stands side by side with God. He stands side by side with him, and that hints at a man who's divine. Whereas the pierced one who was mourned in chapter 12, verse 10, was put to death by the people, that same event's now described as being in the purpose of God. Right? I mean, as declared in Isaiah 53.10, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. So yes, he's put to death by the people, but this is all in the working of God. And so here he's represented as having be, being uh, taken out or, or, or killed by God. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Now, some of this is obscure. But I think that the sheep that are scattered by the killing of the shepherd, those sheep are the people of Israel. Now, they are referred to in the Old Testament. The people of Israel are referred to in the Old Testament as God's sheep. For example, you see in Ezekiel chapter 34, and Jesus came in the first place to gather, he says, the lost sheep of Israel. And you see that, for example, Matthew 10, 5 and 6, Matthew 15, 24. So his being struck, his being arrested and killed calls, caused the disciples who were Jews, it caused them to scatter literally in fear, but it also caused the Jewish masses who had turned their attention to him, see, who were watching him with skepticism, But with a glimmer of hope, it caused them to scatter figuratively. See, his death reinforced their doubt about him being God's shepherd, about him being the Messiah, causing them to harden their hearts further, which scattered them in the figurative sense of further detaching them from God's purpose and direction for their lives. And this majority of Israel that is represented by the two-thirds in verse 8 is condemned by God. But the remainder, those whose scattering is reversed by a turning in faith, they're refined by trials and they then constitute God's new covenant people in verse 9. As he says here, they will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. You see, so this striking, there's some some obscurity here, but this striking of the shepherd scatters Israel, both the disciples and the masses. But there is a group that will turn back in faith and those are the people that are talked about in verse 9. Now in Mark 14, 27... Jesus refers to his disciples' coming abandonment of him as a fulfillment of Zechariah 13, 7, where he says, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. 
Now, this is a paraphrase because in the Hebrew and in the Septuagint, God commands his sword to strike, but it's God doing it. Okay, so he just gives the point of it, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So this is what Jesus said, and it's just interesting, right? I mean, this attack, it's born of human rebellion, this culpable striking of Christ, this lawless murder of the perfect and sinless Son of God, but God has incorporated that rebellion into his plan of redemption. He's made this intent to thwart his plan the means of its achievement. And so I say, when you're talking about God, he's playing chess on levels you don't get. He knows all things. He knows the future. He knows everything. And so it's like when, I, you know, when people engage Jesus and they're trying to get, get the better of him, I just laugh. You watch. They're after Jesus. They're going to trap him. They're going to say this. And Jesus is just like this bullfighter just going, Whew. you whiffed. You know, and so you think just the, the father looking at these things. All right, Exodus 12. We're looking at Old Testament text on the Messiah's suffering and death. Exodus 12, an example of God's foreshadowing the work of Christ through a prophetic picture. You remember I said that there are a number of ways in which the Old Testament refers to Jesus. It does it in prophecies. It does it in institutions. It does it in certain commands. And it does it in prophetic pictures, And this is one of the ways where the work of Christ is foreshadowed through a prophetic picture. And this prophetic picture here, it is the Passover lamb of Exodus chapter 12. Almost 3,500 years ago, as you well know, God delivered the Jewish people from centuries of opposition and slavery in Egypt. And as his final plague on Egypt... He forced Pharaoh to permit the Jews to leave by killing the firstborn, every firstborn in that country. The firstborn of the Jews, however, they were spared because God told them beforehand through Moses to slaughter a year old lamb and sprinkle its blood on the doorposts. Now, the symbolic meal known as Passover was eaten every year thereafter to commemorate that great deliverance, to commemorate God's act of sparing his people from death and taking them from bondage to blessing through the sacrifice of a blemishless lamb. Now, the Last Supper, Jesus ate ate with his disciples, that was a Passover meal, as Chuck mentioned a couple weeks ago in the Lord's Supper. That was a Passover meal, and on that occasion, Jesus instituted a new symbolic meal transcending the original meaning of the Passover. So you have this Passover meal that's loaded with this symbolism about the deliverance of people from bondage to blessing through the slaughter of a blemishless lamb, And then Jesus is in the Last Supper, he is eating a Passover meal, but he then transcends the meaning of that, the original meaning of it. He transformed that ancient meal in light of his rescuing work. So he winds up telling him that the bread represents his body and the juice represents his blood. As Paul says plainly in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's the Passover lamb. He is the innocent one who was sacrificed that God's people might be spared from death and taken from the bondage of the devil to the glory of of the kingdom of God. I'm getting some kind of feedback back there. Is that I, I hear my voice echoing <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. Maybe somebody ought to go turn that down. People in the lobby be going, what are you doing? <laughs> but he, so that, that's, you, you see that. So taken in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Peter says there that they were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of an unblemished 
and spotless lamb. He's probably alluding to the blemishless requirement of the Passover lamb in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. There are other sacrifices that require that the lamb be without blemish, but he's probably referring to the Passover sacrifice there. Then in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, where it says, It shall be eaten in one house, you shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. Well, God here, he commands the Israelites not to break any of the Passover lamb's bones, and you see this idea in Numbers chapter 9, verse 12. And then the apostle John, he clearly alludes to this. When he says of the fact the soldiers didn't break Jesus' legs when he was on the cross, John says, but when they came to him, they saw he was already dead. They didn't break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Verse 35, he who saw it's born witness. And you get down to verse 36, for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Well, that's what was said of the Passover lamb. You see, you're not to break any of his bones. So John recognizes in the fact his bones weren't broken that that's a tie to the Old Testament. That was a fulfillment of the requirement that the Passover lamb, Paul says Jesus is the Passover lamb. Right here, Exodus. That's a fulfillment of that text. Then in Exodus chapter 24, verse 8, here's another example of God foreshadowing the work of Christ through a prophetic picture. You have in Exodus 24, verse 8, it says, And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So here he has Moses. Moses, in this instance, he formalized the terms of the covenant. By taking the blood from the sacrifices, the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, and he throws half of it against the altar, and then he throws half of it over the people, saying, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. And the focus here on these sacrifices, these sacrifices of burnt offering and peace offering, the focus here is that the sacrifice, it functioned to formalize or to inaugurate the Mosaic covenant between God and his people. It seals the covenant. It formalizes the covenant, these sacrifices. And this covenant formalizing or covenant inaugurating function of those sacrifices, that foreshadowed the covenant formalizing or covenant inaugurating function of Christ's death. In other words, his sacrifice is foreshadowed by sacrifices in addition to the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Clearly, that's something of, that foreshadows Christ's sacrifice. Paul tells us that. Peter says that. John refers to no, none of his bones will be broken. But there are other sacrifices that foreshadow the sacrifice of, of Christ. And this, these sacrifices that function as a covenant formalizing or covenant inaugurating thing, they are foreshadowing Christ's sacrifice. Jesus echoed the words of Moses in referring to the blood that he would shed in his crucifixion as what? He says in Matthew 26, and he took the cup and we'd given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all, this is my blood of the covenant. Right? That's exactly what Moses is saying in instituting the Mosaic covenant. He takes that blood, throws it on the altar, throws it on the people and says, this is the blood of the covenant. Well, that's what Jesus is saying. You see, so you have the Passover lamb, then you have the sacrifices that function as covenant uh, formalizing or covenant inaugurating and you see in Luke twenty two twenty, you see that referred to as Jesus speaks of the new covenant in his blood and likewise the cup after they'd eaten saying the cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood first Corinthians eleven twenty five. in the same way after the supper he took the cup also saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood so you see this function, you see this role being foreshadowed, and he's re referring here, of course, to the new covenant of Jeremiah chapter 31. So we have the Mosaic covenant, 
that is uh, inaugurated, confirmed, or whatever, with, with the throwing and sprinkling of this blood. And then we have the new covenant that is promised in Jeremiah 31 with the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter Head, he says that although we have seen a multifaceted presentation of Jesus' death in the four Gospels, including but by no means limited to language which alludes to various types of sacrifices, the fundamental aspect of the Gospel presentation of the death of Jesus understood as sacrifice should probably be regarded as that of covenant inauguration. So he's thinking this is a, a, a dominant theme in the presentation of Christ's sacrifice. He says, the Gospels then rightly introduce the New Testament representing the inauguration of the new covenant in the death of Christ and providing the key which links the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, Christ's death being the means by which the new both fulfills and displaces the old. So when we're looking at these uh, references to Jesus in the Old Testament, you have these prophetic foreshadowings of his work. You see them in the Passover lamb. You see them in the covenant uh, inaugurating function that you, that you have here, this covenant formalizing thing. But you also see it, in, for example, in Leviticus 4, another foreshadowing dealing with sacrifice. In addition to the Passover sacrifice and the covenant formalizing or inaugurating sacrifice, Christ's work also is pictured in the sin or purification offering that's prescribed in the Old Testament, the sacrifice through which atonement was provided for sin. That is foreshadowing the sacrifice of Jesus. It's not that the sacrifice of animals was the actual basis of divine forgiveness. Why, we recognize that. I mean, the writer of Hebrews says quite clearly in Hebrews 10.4 that those sacrifices of bulls and goats, they have no atoning efficacy. They don't actually atone for anything. Rather, the offering of them was merely the, the occasion for which forgiveness was granted under the old covenant on the basis of Christ's future sacrifice. You see, so God forgives in association with these animal sacrifices that have no inherent atoning efficacy because Christ is coming. So Christ's death goes backward and forward in terms of the forgiveness of sin. All divine forgiveness is based on that sacrifice. And so when, you, when you're looking here and you see well, these sacrifices in the Old Testament that are atoning, that go, with regard to which God forgives sins, well, you see that they are pointing forward to the sacrifice of Christ. That the sin offering in the Old Testament, as well as we have the, we have the Passover lamb, we have the covenant formalizing or inaugurating function of sacrifices. Well, we also have the sin offering that foreshadows this work of Christ. And that the sin offering in the Old Testament foreshadowed Christ's death. That's clear from the fact his death is, is represented throughout the New Testament as a sin offering. As a sacrifice that atones for sin. I don't claim this is exhaustive, but that ought to give you a good idea. You see, all over the New Testament, you have this idea that Christ's death atones for sin. You see, just to take one, in Hebrews chapter 10, 11 to 13, it says, And every priest stands day after day ministering and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which never are able to take away sins, but this one. But this one, having offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. So you see all over, and you can look at many other passages. So this, in the Old Testament, as I see what's, what's God doing with the blood of bulls and goats, it, they don't atone. But what's he doing? He's foreshadowing. 
Do you see? He's foreshadowing the work of Christ. It is a prophetic picture of the coming sacrifice. And so he does a lot with that. Now, the function of Christ's death as a co covenant formalizing or inaugurating sacrifice, it's linked to its efficacy in atoning for, si for sin. You see, these things aren't separated. This is clear from a text like Matthew 26, 27, 28, where he says, and he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. Okay, that covenant formalizing, that covenant inaugurating function, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So you see, they're related. The covenant formalizing or inaugurating function is tied to the atoning sacrificial function. So they're not something that's, that's separated. Covenant inauguration, atonement for sin, they're just, they're different perspectives on the one sacrifice. And the Passover sacrifice is another perspective. So you have a lot of different foreshadowings that God is doing with regard to sacrifices in the Old Testament, these prophetic pictures that are looking forward. So when you talk about what well, we're looking at, at how the Old Testament represents the death of Christ, the suffering and death of Jesus, well, these are included in that. And then we have Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. This is yet another of the prophetic pictures of Christ's death here in, in 20, Numbers 21, 8 and 9, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who's bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. You recall that the Lord, he sent, in, in Numbers 21, 5, the Israelites, they once again, they spoke against God and they spoke against Moses. And in 21.5, they're saying, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So they're saying that. And the Lord, he then sends poisonous snakes among them. And there wasn't any anti-venom then. <laughs> There was no cure for these poisonous snakes, so anyone who was bitten had no hope of life. If you were bitten by one of these snakes, you were dead. Okay? You were already dead once you were bitten. You were a dead man walking. The only, the only time you had left was how long it took the venom to kill you. That's it for you. And in fact, many Israelites died. But the people, they come to Moses in, in verse 7, and they say, We've sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses, he prays for the people, but rather than take the serpents away, God tells Moses what we just read. He tells him, no, what you do, you make an image of the poisonous snake, and you put it up on a pole. So you mount this image of a poisonous snake, this replica of a snake. You put it up on a pole. And then he said that when anybody's been bitten by the snake, when they see that replica on the pole, they would live. And so in verse 9, he says, So Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole. If a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Well, there's a sense, right, in which all of mankind has been bitten by a deadly serpent. We all sinned through the influence of the evil one, the ancient serpent. And as, as a result, we all at one time were without any hope of life. We all were dead men walking. And do I have to say dead women too? Or can we understand that men can function that way? Okay. I'll probably get flogged for that. But let's just take it that way as a collective. But you understand, that's how we were, right? We were all that. Well, Jesus says, as you know, in John 3, 14 and 15, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. 
So here we have this serpent up on this pole. And Jesus said, just as that was a way of looking, I have to be lifted up. I have to be raised up on that cross. So whoever looks to me, now of course meaning looks to me in faith, who sees me with belief, understanding who I am and what I've done and trust in that, well, as the person who looks at the serpent replica will be healed and saved, those who have been bitten by the ultimate serpent who have no hope of life, who look to me when I'm raised up, they will be saved. Do you see the foreshadowing? And you might read numbers and go, why is God doing what kind of thing? Why would he do that? And I just see the people, oh God, that's just stupid. Right? I mean, don't people say just the craziest things about God? They have absolutely no sense and respect of who he is. They say, well, no, maybe God's a little slicker than you give him credit for. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's doing something that if you would just be quiet for a moment and try to learn something, instead of assuming that you who have never studied or thought about any of these things were born knowing all of them, no, no, I don't want to do that. Okay, well, he's doing something, and there you see it. I think you see this foreshadowing that, he, that Christ that, that is represented in what, what's going on. So our Lord's lifted up on the cross. He dies, of course, as a sacrifice for sins, and that is our life when we look to him. Now, I want to go to, remember, the, the first thing, we looked at a bunch of texts that in them you, you see... The New Testament says the Old Testament refers to Jesus. We read, I think we looked at 16 texts that show that. And they say, look, they indicate, point to Jesus because they refer to his suffering, death, and resurrection. So I've just taken you through a number of texts that look at his suffering and his death. I now want to look at texts in the Old Testament that refer to the Messiah's resurrection. Okay, so that's where we are organizationally. And the first one I want to look at is Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. And in Psalm chapter 2, it speaks of the nation's rebellion against God and his anointed king of Israel. So, you know, anointing, this is what something that would be done to a king. It says, as God chooses one, that selection is represented in this anointing of him with oil. And anointed one, that is the word Messiah. That's what a Messiah is. He's the anointed one. Okay, so you have people who are anointed in lower capacities. So the king was one of God's anointed ones. But then there is the anointed one. The ultimate king. So he is the Messiah. Okay, the anointed one. But here you have Psalm, it speaks of the nations rebelling against God and against the king God has installed in Jerusalem. And it says they do so in vain because God, the heavenly king, has placed his king on the throne in Jerusalem. God has placed his king on the throne, and he will provide him dominion over all the nations. And as Tremper Longman points out in his commentary on Psalms, he says this psalm almost certainly was used during the monarchical period, during the kingship, the monarchical period as a song that accompanied the installation ceremony of the son of David who assumed the throne after the death of his father. Well, is that any surprise? That as you are crowning a new king, we would say, they would say anointing, right? This is the, this is the, the thing. But we would say as, you, as you're crowning a new king, a new son of David, well, it, it makes perfect sense that this song would be sung. Because look at it. God, you, this is God's agent ruling his people in Jerusalem. He has put him on the throne. So they would sing this song. Now, in the first century, it's important to recognize that this psalm, it was widely understood to be a reference to the Messiah, to include a reference to the Messiah, the ultimate Davidic king. 
the ultimate anointed one. It was interpreted that way by the rabbis. It was interpreted that way by the Qumran community. You know, those who brought us the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essene community. It was interpreted that way. It was, it was understood stood then, you see, to, to have that messianic reference. To include that. And in verses 6 and 7, they make clear that God's becoming the father, God's becoming the father of the king, his, quote, begetting him. God's becoming the father of the king refers to the king's enthronement. It refers to the king's enthronement to his formal public identification as Israel's king. You see, in that setting, talking about those kings, this idea of their becoming God's son, his begetting them in that sense, it's tied to their public identification as king. That is when they become God's son. Okay? Now, though Jesus certainly is the son of God before his resurrection... All right, none of us are adoptionists. We don't believe that Jesus wasn't the Son of God and that at some later point he became the Son of God. All right, he is the Son of God. He certainly was the Son of God before his resurrection. You can see, for example, in Luke 1.35, Gabriel's words to Mary. Luke 3.22, the announcement at Jesus' baptism. So he's certainly the Son of God before his resurrection. But there's a sense in which his resurrection was a formal, public declaration and identification of that fact. Right? He's the son. But there's something about this public proclamation where Jesus then moves to a different stage of his messianic work. There's something that happens there in that. The public revelation... It's suggested in Peter's words on Pentecost where he says, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. And, uh, and of that we're all witnesses, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain. Do you see the function that this is playing in this public declaration? This public proclamation of who Jesus is. He's always the Son of God. But there's something that happens in his resurrection that is public, that is analogous to this public identification of the worldly king in Jerusalem that is going to be used to say, at that time, God, in that sense, became his father. Okay? So he says here, let all house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. Know that by virtue of this resurrection. Something has happened. Is that second, Bill? Okay, first. Know that, know that, 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 that this has happened. Now, Paul, Paul expressly ties Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 to Jesus' resurrection in his speech in Acts 13, 30 to 33. He says, but God raised him from the dead... And for many days he appeared to those who had come with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, Old Testament, what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus as also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Okay, so it would be easy for us to miss that. Well, he, he's tying that. You would say, what does that have to do with the resurrection? Okay, well, it's in the same sense in Psalm 2-7 with this public identification. There is a sense in which at that time this earthly king becomes a son. 
And though Christ is always the Son of God, there is some sense in what happens in the public proclamation of his resurrection, there is a sense, as in 2.7, that that's tied to his becoming the Son. That's why he says here, you are my Son, today I have begotten you. So that Psalm 2.7 was about Christ. It was pointing forward and talking about Jesus. In Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul refers to a transition in Jesus' messianic role that was effected, that was brought about by his resurrection. The eternal Son of God, Jesus the Christ, he was appointed, he was appointed Son of God in power from the resurrection. There was a transition. Something happened. He was appointed Son of God in power from the resurrection on the basis of the resurrection. In other words, before the resurrection, he was Son of God in weakness and the lowliness of his human existence. As Paul spells out in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Think this way among you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, didn't consider being equal with God as something to be used for his own advantage, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, by being born in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, therefore... He became humble and obedient even to the point of death on a cross. Therefore, God, also God, highly exalted him. You see then this obedient to death and then he is exalted. There is something that happens here in this public proclamation of the resurrection Following his submission to crucifixion, he says, Also God highly exalted him, graciously gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, that in the heavenly ones, the earthly ones, the ones under the earth, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you have this idea, see? You have this, this, this change. There's something about the, a shift or a change in his messianic career. There is something that happens in his resurrection. And what I'm saying to you is that what is said in Psalm chapter 2 ties in with that transition that is related to this public demonstration of his identity in the resurrection. And there is a sense in which it is said that he then becomes. But you just have to be careful. When you talk like that, people will hear adoptionist. They will hear, no, 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 what you're saying is that he wasn't the son and he later became the son. No, I'm not saying that. That would be heretical, <laughs> you see. I'm just saying there's some tie here in a sense that you see. Now, the writer of, of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3, second part of that verse through 5, he links Jesus' resurrection by implication from his ascension. He talks about his ascension, which implies his resurrection. So he links his resurrection to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. He says, after providing purification of the sins... Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, having become. And you and I would go, well, wait a minute, he's always more glorious. But no, there, you see, there's a sense of exaltation that God gives him through his obedience. I heard that bell. He says, having become as much greater than the angels as the name he's inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you? You would say, well, wait a minute, what does that have to do with his resurrection? Well, that's what I'm trying to get you to see. There is a Psalm 2-7 sense in which this public display can be said to be God's, his becoming the Son of God in that sense. Okay, so 2-7, when you're talking about resurrection, you see it in Paul, you see it in the Hebrew writers. They understand that 2-7 is in fact referring to the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, Lord willing, next week, thanks for coming.